Right, so I'm Adrienne Tumor and lecturer at Brunel University. Now, I did an engineering degree, a bridge engineering degree, and ended up doing my PhD on masonry arch bridges uh, and also monitoring. Uh, I've been talking to Kevin Dentis, who is the bridge engineer at Devon County Council, and wanted to have a quick overview about the type of bridges that bridge owners have and it's just just where are we at the moment in terms of bridges and I'm sure uh, we've got lots of people here you've got a much better understanding of uh, how good your bridges are what the issues are uh, and so on so Kevin Dentis is a chief engineer at Devon County Council uh, this is the location of all his bridges. So he has 3,200 3, bridges. Uh, they can be, yeah, some of them are concrete, some of them are steel or metallic, and some are masonry. Now, this is a quick summary. Looking at his bridge stock, looking at the first column here, is what, are, what type of bridges uh, does he have? Now in Devon, 70% of the bridges are masonry. 10% is metallic and 20% is reinforced concrete. Now, um, in where you live, it might be completely the opposite. You may not have any masonry bridges and you may only have reinforced concrete and some metallic. So it very much depends on the location. But in Devon, uh, Devon is perhaps a specialist case with lots of masonry bridges. Now, having so many masonry bridges, how much does Kevin, uh, Kevin spend, uh, how much money out of his maintenance budget does he spend on which type of bridge? So he spends 20% of his budget on 20% of reinforced concrete bridges, spends 77% of his money on metallic bridges, but there are some special cases, cast iron bridges, and 3% on uh, masonry. So that's quite interesting that the 70% of his bridge stock is only requiring 3% of his budget. In terms of CO2 emission, looking at maintenance costs as well as the transport and the diversion, uh, so diversion routes causing CO, additional CO2 emission, still masonry art which is account for the least amount of CO2 emission. Now, looking at the, uh, so in terms of his 77% of maintenance issues, what are they? Uh, most of them are to do with substandard parapets, waterproofing, post tension, special inspection, joints and bearings. So he spends most of his money basically on reinforced concrete and steel bridge elements. Now, does that actually resonate with anyone at all. So I don't know if we've got people who are bridge owners uh, either in the UK or overseas. I would be perhaps afterwards be very interested to have your opinion uh, whether that is representative or not. Now, this is what we have now. What, what is the history of bridges? So going back 2000 years, masonry arch bridges have been the most popular up until the 17, 1750s and definitely 1900s. So they, domin they were the dominant form of bridge construction. So going back 2000 years, uh, you probably recognize uh, most of these bridges. The first one is obviously uh, in Venice. Now, how old do you think this bridge is? And I'm not sure if we are allowed to write things in the chat box, but if anyone is willing to sort of knows the date when this bridge was built or the name of the bridge, you're welcome to uh, message it or any of these bridges. So if not, i uh, just quickly go through this. Uh, 300 years, you are uh, very close. So the Rialto, yes, it's uh, basically 1600s. Yeah, three, three, four hundred 300 years. The next one is Mostar Bridge 
you probably uh, know it. So that's 15th century, so about five, 600 years again. The next one is Pontegarde. So that was built by the Romans. And the last one is near the Vatican. So Vatican is on the left. It is in, in Rome and was built obviously by the Romans, but not obviously, but built by the Romans about 134 AD. So all these one just give us the indicate that masonry bridges can last 2000 years or well over that. Uh, what is the design life for from current bridges? 120 years. So you, although we've got much more of technology and advanced tools, our bridge efforts isn't quite up to uh, sort of equal to the Roman 2000 bridge, uh, the Roman bridges that can last 2000 years. Now I came across a project in Tanzania uh, before Christmas, uh, the Enobel, which is the Belgian Development Agency, is building 70, 70 stone bridges in Tanzania. They are working together with the local roads authority, which is Tarura. So Enobel and Tarura are engaging with local communities in remote villages, uh, remote locations, within an agriculture project. So they uh, came up with this bridge construction project where they're building 70 new stone bridges to enable people to get to markets. This is absolutely an amazing project. I, I couldn't believe what I've heard and what I've seen. So basically, they've got here are some pictures. They've got the local community is uh, very much involved in the construction process. They bring the stones. They gather the stones like this from the fields. They either bring it or they, it gets picked up by uh, the Belgian uh, sort of uh, with, uh, with Annabelle. The, uh, Annabelle is the Belgian development agency. So either they bring it on their heads or anyway they can on bicycles. So they provide the stones and they dig the foundations. So that is done by the local uh, community. Annabelle is paying then uh, for stone masons to build a bridge. They don't generally have electricity on site, so they use they do everything man manually. So three tapes for measuring the uh, abutments and the piers, doing everything man manually, but beautifully precise. Uh, here the abutments have been built. Then. This, the centering is being delivered to site. Here it is being put together. Now you probably see that this is the centering, which is made up of two of these parts. And because it will be an eight meter span bridge, it's put together in the river. Uh, uh, by the way, this is an alternative to cross the river. So there's very much need for building new bridges in, in these locations. The, the centering is being put together and planking put on top, then they are ready to go. Here, they placed stones up uh, manually and a bit of progress here. Art is nearly ready. And here, uh, the art has been completed. I like these pictures because you don't often see an arch bridge exposed. You see them when they get sort of refurbished occasionally. But when you are, for example, talking about ring thickness, so can you guess, can you estimate the ring thickness in the one on the top left-hand corner? Uh, obviously the stones vary because they are local and random. However, in, in Tanzania, in, in uh, Kigoma, region, they're very, so very careful to make sure that the, the smallest stone is the minimum arch ring thickness. So in this case, although some stones are larger, some are smaller, the smaller ones should be the minimum ring thickness which is required. Next step, once the arch ring is built, the backing, you can see the uh, stones at the back of, on, uh, at the two ends of the arch here. 
uh, being put up. And this is the end of the bridge, which again, you don't often see, but well, you probably never see that. And the backing is complete. Here, the spandrel walls have been put up with a little, uh, parapets are very small generally because different regulations, but so this bridge is here ready to go. After that, uh, obviously, fill is put on top, the archering and the backing, and the, so it was basically finished. So did, most of the bridges that I've seen were about eight meter span. Some are single span, some are multi-span. So this is an eight meter span semicircular bridge, while this is obviously segmental. This is a multi-span bridge with small, much smaller spans. And this is one of my, couple of my favorite pictures. So this was taken when the scaffolding on the second arch was well, nearly finished, I'd say. And the next picture, the follow-up picture is the arch completed. So the question is, how long do you think, how many days or weeks have passed between this picture and the next picture? So do we have any suggestions? If you know the answer, please don't tell. <laughs> so any estimates? Uh, no, but the, so the difference between the two pictures is 11 days. So without any uh, electricity and any machinery, they do everything by hand, they can do an archering in 11 days. And that's completing the scaffolding as well, or the centering as well. So it really doesn't take that long. Here, the bridge has been completed. And there's some hidden elements in this. Uh, very uh, generally, they put the backing up to the top, but not generally. Sometimes they put the backing up to the top. Sometimes they've got hidden arches behind, which this particular one has. So the next question is, is it, why is it, why are they doing this? Is it feasible? So initially they looked at the cost for concrete bridges and Willem who, uh, who is working, who is leading or has been leading this project and Stephen, they realized that it's just impossibly expensive building stone br uh, concrete bridges. Uh, they looked into the op op option of building stone bridges and uh, that the cost for that is about 84% lower than concrete. Of course, this is uh, for Tanzania. In terms of CO2 emission, as you would expect, so stone is available, don't need to do anything with it, just put it in, build it in. So the CO2 emission is about 77% lower. So certainly very much viable for Tanzania. Now the next, next question is, what does it mean for us? Is it viable in the UK or not and internationally? When I was living in Bristol, I developed a, a proposal to build a bridge, a stone bridge across Bridge Valley Road, which is a, a busy road going downhill uh, to the Avon Gorge. This road is separating the downs in Clifton so the idea was to build a, store, a, a bridge to connect two parts of the dance. This is a, 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 50, a 50 meter long bridge, three spans, about 12 meter span. So that is the proposed uh, rough design. Now we got planning permission to build a bridge, which was the first one for hundred years, basically in the UK for a completely new stone bridge. However, we, another permission was refused, which was to do with the Act 38, to do with the down status in Bristol. So the, we didn't manage to progress on the, on the bridge. However, it was very useful to look into the costs and see whether the, in principle, a stone bridge construction would be viable for the UK. Here are some figures for you. Um, an estimate for a steel bridge, pedestrian, bridge would have been one and a half million. Doing a three span uh, masonry arch bridge, so identical to this, but made out of brick instead of stone, would have cost 
right, perhaps 1.6 million, so slightly more than still, but not very much more. And if you if you choose to uh, build out of stone, it would have been a, just below or just around 2 million. The difference between steel and brick masonry is about 30%. I, very often when you ask you talk to people, they expect stone bridge construction to be incredibly expensive. And that is based on just because there haven't been any projects around the UK for about 100 years. The last stone bridges were built in 1920s, after which concrete and steel took over. So the, I, I reckon the, so the construction cost for, uh, for stone bridges is about 30% higher. So th this is the investment. What about the life expectancy? I know that as engineers, you, you are mostly focused on 120 years life expectancy, but what is real life? Uh, steel bridges would probably last you 100 or 200 years. Brick bridges, probably a little lo uh, longer, two to 400 years. And stone bridges, like we have, we have seen the Rialto Bridge or the bridges in Rome, uh, and about three to 500 years, but obviously they can last a lot longer than that. So the durability and the life expectancy of bridges isn't actually taken into account uh, in the UK when do you design them. So 120 years doesn't actually give you a realistic figure. Very often, steel, steel bridges need constant repainting and maintenance, and concrete is not doesn't last forever either. Now, if you design, divide the life expectancy of these bridges by these sort of figures, you get a very different sort of uh, figure. In that case, the, the obviously bridges or structures that don't last that long it would be sort of proportionately be more expensive. So the yearly cost, just, I just very simply divided by 100 or 200 or 300 years. But the, so the average cost per year investment is about half for stone. You invested 30% extra, but just for the uh, initial investment, you've got, a, uh, it is much cheaper for the future. In terms, but, Obviously, there's one thing building it, and what about maintaining it? Teslin Balukun, who did his PhD on looking at the maintenance, uh, uh, the uh, CO2 emission and environmental impact of maintenance activities for bridges, he looked at steel, concrete, and masonry. Steel and concrete had very similar <clears throat> environmental impact, while masonry had about a quarter. So this is representing the 110, 20 years life expectancy, the theoretical life expectancy for, for these bridges. So in every way, masonry is, seems to be much more beneficial because it lasts longer and has less uh, lower maintenance needs. So in terms of feasibility for the UK, CO2 emission of stone bridges is about 80% lower than concrete and steel bridges. You might think that construction time would take, construction would take a lot longer. It's not necessarily the case, I would say not at all. It's probably not unusual for say a concrete bridge construction to take six months, a year. Uh, the bridge that you've seen in Tanzania a uh, single span, eight meters, is eight si single span, eight meter span arch bridge would take them about a month to build. So there's certainly, and that's without any machinery and electricity. So there's no reason why masonry bridges, stone bridges would last actually longer than concrete or steel. So I, I estimate the construction time about the same as concrete or steel or even quicker. So it just depends. And obviously, some of the concrete bridges and steel bridges are put up very quickly. Uh, so we spoke about the two pictures with 11 days difference. And how many people worked on these bridges? 
this is the sort of team. The guy in the middle, he's the trainer and the four guys are trainees. They, they, they are trained on one bridge for a few months, a month or two or three, depends how long it takes for them to build. So larger, larger bridges would take more than a month, but, and sometimes they've got flood, the monsoon, which means they have to stop for six months. So it can vary. So once the trainees complete the training on one bridge, they, are, they can then apply to be the head mason on a, a next bridge. So it's a really, really nice setup, very much into give it, creating skills for the local people as well. Now, what about costs? Obviously the costs in Tanzania are wildly different from costs in the UK. In the UK, I estimated the cost, uh, stone bridges to cost uh, perhaps about 30% extra, but I'm sure you can, if you use, but that is for cut stone, so neatly cut uh, masonry. If you use random rubble, I think you would actually be cheaper or at about the same as concrete or steel. With caffeine dentists in, Den in Devon, we are talking about utilizing waste stone from quarries to build stone bridges. So this, is, this would be random rubble. The material is cheap because you, it might be too small, the, the stones are, might be too, uh, too small for cut stone or, 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 or paving stones. So you might be able to get material very cheaply. In that case, there is no, uh, no problem with sort of masonry bridges being too expensive. And finally, the life expectancy, as we discussed, uh, would at least last, but probably about twice as long as concrete or steel. So that is my uh, estimate, uh, my sort of summary for feasibility for stone bridges in the UK. How do I get this? I love that thing. Okay. Environmental impact. The, at the moment, uh, we are more generally looking at 120 years of design life for bridges. Uh, is that realistic? Well, clearly not. If some of your stone bridges is going to last 300 years and some of the new stone uh, steel, steel or concrete bridges are not going to last 120. So we need something in terms of environmental impact, which is more realistic. Uh, so I, it needs to include a realistic life expectancy and it needs to in, include traffic delays, which are caused by maintenance and, and other issues. So if you include realistic time expectancy, I think you've got a very different picture. I'm talking, I'm looking for government policymakers and contacting MPs to uh, start connecting with them in terms of how do we actually uh, include sustainability into bridge design? Is 120 years a realistic measure to use? So my proposal is for environmental impact to be estimated not for the design life, but for the estimated life expectancy. This would give you a very different picture as you have seen earlier. Life expectancy would definitely have an impact on the sustainability aspect of bridges. So if anyone is involved in policy making, and uh, I would be very interested to talk, uh, talking to you on this. So that was the environmental impact. The next, I just see, okay. Well, answer the question afterward, afterwards. Next issue I'd like to look at is, how do you actually get bridges built in the UK or overseas when no one has actually has any experience with it. I teach at Brunel University and to be honest, the undergraduate civil engineering curriculum doesn't require students to know anything about masonry bridges. We teach masonry design for buildings, but certainly not bridges. And I think this is general for the UK and most countries. So if civil engineers 
and architects are not taught how to build these bridges, they will certainly be reluctant to start using them. So there is great need to provide easy tools for people to, to be able to use and case studies to gain confidence in these bridges. Now, Annabelle, the Belgian Development Agency, came up with an excellent uh, brief uh, stone arch bridges design manual. So this was written for people who basically know nothing about bridges, explaining them in detail, the principles, how to build them, with lots of pictures and explanation, material selection, everything is included. It's a small document and some of you may have seen it. And what is really lovely that it actually gives you tables. So depending on the size of the bridge you need, you can just put all the numbers in the basic dimensions and it gives you all the numbers you need. Like how many spades and wheelbarrows do you need? How many uh, bags of cement and things? So it, it's brilliant. That's what, what we, we need. Now, there are two tables which are the key, the, the focus of, these, of this design manual. So this is all you get in terms of how to design these bridges in Tanzania. One table for semicircular bridges and one table for uh, segmental bridges. Right, making it a little bigger. So for example, if you want to build an eight meter span bridge, it will give you the dimensions for 40 ton loading. So this is standard highway loading. Uh, the thick, uh, ring thickness, V is 0 0.45 meters. It also, it's, you can build it as a sort of constant ring or you, as they do it in, in Tanzania, they actually build it slightly differently. It, you can add backing instead of having a tapered arch ring thickness. It gives you the, so all the dimensions you need. So this is, I think, what we need in the first instance to help you guys and ladies and everyone who is interested in building stone bridges. So I'm talking to the, the Belgians and Tanzanians and people around the world who are interested to take this document and adopt it to, uh, for interna international standards. So what we are going to do next is stay, uh, adjusting this. The tables themselves might actually remain. We might have to add a few other elements, but need to then look around the world and what are the other aspects that, we, that this, the manual needs to be, it needs to include. So if you are interested updating the design manual for uh, building stone arch bridges, please get in touch and I will be delighted to have people uh, sort of involved in the working group. What next? So we, we heard it's feasible, we heard it's possible, we heard it's being done. And the next, uh, the plan for the UK is to build the first stone arch bridge uh, in, in Devon next year. So Kevin has identified, a, I think that's a, uh, an old bridge, so, uh, eight meter span uh, concrete bridge, which is which needs to be replaced. Now, if you work for the uh, canals or uh, canal on canal bridges, you probably have come across uh, replacement uh, stone arch bridge replacements. So those are the first ones that I've seen where they used. Uh, stone bridges to replace existing ones. Very often using the abutments, just replacing the arch ring. So it, they, they were brilliant. And it just shows again that it's doable, it's not difficult. So what's the future? Here is a, my summary of where we are at the moment. So I think everyone is pretty, so pretty uh, aware of the sustainability aspect, the low whole life costs long life expectancy and res resilience for these bridges. What we need to do is to update the technology so that it moves from being a traditional and small scale construction method to become a modern and large scale construction method. 
how do, how do we achieve that? What we need to do is digitize the whole sector. There's an awful lot of digital technology already included in, in stone construction, quarrying, and design. However, they are all separate activities. What we need is to have to link them together. And it's almost like raise awareness of the digital aspects and fill in the gaps where it doesn't yet exist. So design software, and we need to come up with easy to use design software and guidelines. We can include digitization and optimization into various parts of the, of the sector of the industry, for example, quarrying, the stone cutting, transportation and construction. So the tools are available, but they need to be adopted for stone construction. Autom automated construction. Now you may have come across uh, uh, adverts for a, a Brunel, the, oh, what do you call, uh, call it, the, a research festival in May, so it's starting next week. We've got a session on Tuesday. Dr. Michael Rustel is organizing a session in uh, robotics, uh, AI. So he is going to give a talk on what we are doing at Brunel and some brilliant people doing robotics and AI. We are also looking at including robotics into digital uh, automated construction on site using stone, so stone arch bridges. So we have some uh, robotic arms ready for you. If you happen to be in, in, if you are able to come along next Tuesday, come and play with some robots. So we are looking at robotic construction. Now, if, if you say to a young so a te teenager, if they are interested in stone construction, I think the answer would be very much no, thank you very much. If you say to them, would you be able to use your games technology skills and uh, robotic skills to develop, uh, to build stone bridges using digital technology? I think they would be much more interested. So it's also, digitization is also a way to engage young generation and build up the stone industry. Now, since we are starting almost fresh with stone bridge construction and stone construction, the plan is to include digital te uh, sensor technology. It's very easy to build things in. The question is, what do we need and how can we make the bridges sort of talk to you? Uh, how can we, so we can obviously uh, offer a digital twin and a sort of sensing bridges. So that, that is very straightforward. And digital twin asset management, they all, they all can be digitized. BIM obviously could be an idea to adopt for stone construction. At the moment, it's not really uh, suited. And that would give us, lead us into digital stone construction. So most of these aspects are already available. Some are already used in uh, stone construction, but we need to come up with a strategic plan for uh, what technology and what development do we want to uh, organize? It, do we want to develop for the next five to ten years, and come up with an in, uh, with a holistic and multidisciplinary research project, which includes a whole range of elements in this? Now, where are we in sustainability, and where are we in digital technology aspect? And this is the final slide. You will be pleased to know. So sustainability is obviously very high. Digital technology, the tools are available. So we are not starting from scratch, we are introducing it. But I think we need this dial, the smaller dial to move from the left gradually towards the right. So at the moment, you can certainly use traditional small scale construction, but the plan is to provide tools for engineers and architects and builders to be able to build a, Stone, stone bridges and buildings at a large scale. So finally, if you are interested 
in any of these, or you have an idea for piloting stone construction where you are, do get in contact. So thank you very much. Okay, th thanks very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, we do have a few questions. Okay, I just stopped sharing. So the, so the first question was, um, what type of mortar are they using? And I assume that was in Tanzania. Yes, I, yes, that's a really good question. Now, bearing in mind that the history of stone bridges wasn't that well known in Tanzania and the engineers were more familiar with modern construction, they were using cement mortar. Now, as most of you probably know, the masonry bridges mostly used, used to use lime mortar. So after discussion with the engineers in Tanzania, uh, they, they decided to now shift from cement, very strong cementitious mortar to actually more lime-based mortar. But for the future, definitely any new stone construction has to, has to use lime mortar, whatever, whichever type is suitable. Fantastic. The, um, the next question was, um, are these standardized designs, load capacities to ring thickness, foundation conditions, all on rock? I think this question did come before the, the table that you did. Um, yes. Was, was, was that table to be founded on rock or? Um, now that's a good question. The principle for masonry bridges, as you most of you know, is that the foundations don't, don't move as soon as you've got obviously uh, movement in the foundations that you've got big problems. So we assume everything is on solid foundations. If not, obviously, you need to build proper foundations. Yes. <laughs> uh, we've got another one there. Stone has grain. So should codes of practice take this into account as timber? Um, it's not actually that important, to be honest. So most of the, the stress level, how, how much stress do you get in masonry arch bridges? What do you think? So when you, the arch ring is the load bearing element. If you think about the stresses in, in those, uh, the stress level is about two Newton per millimeter square, two to five, five is really high. So you are talking about really, really, really small stresses generally. I mean, you might get the odd case, but, and odd, fail, and odd bridge when you've got really serious problems because of cracks and rocking and uh, Bill Harvey has obviously could tell you, talk to you lots about bridges which have real issues and you've got, it's not quite enough. But generally, uh, assuming everything is in compression, you've got uh, up to well, between probably two to five Newton per millimeter square stress level. If you have, if your stone is, say, if you if your masonry strength, so combine uh, stone and mortar, perhaps lime mortar, hopefully lime mortar, is about 10 Newton per millimeter square, then you are still okay. So I reckon you can use anything above 20 Newton per millimeter square stone, but that would be about the minimum. I, I guess I would be probably comfortable with 40 Newton per millimeter squares uh, unit strengths. And if you've got anything stronger than that, the strength is not an issue. These bridges almost never fail by compression. Another issue might be the durability and uh, environmental impact. So just make sure that you use your stone wisely, you sort of the bedding planes are oriented accordingly. So uh, there is some bit more, obviously a lot more to it and stone masons have a huge amount of knowledge on this one. Uh, but generally you don't, strength isn't really an issue. Now, uh, it may be that uh, the question was, uh, was about particular about grain. So I'm not sure if you've got sort of any other sort of thoughts about effect of grain, then I'm happy to sort of chat afterwards on the grain side as well. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, how did they manage with coffee dams in Tanzania? Pass, don't know. Pass, no problem. Um, this, is an, this one's from Mike. 
What is the scope of adoption in the UK? Are you speaking with the environmental agency or other local authorities who have many bridges to look after? Scope of adoption. Um, I guess the Mike, I think it was the sort of starting building it. Yes, there's a design guidelines, the MRB. So there's a design guidelines guideline for uh, building stone uh, arch bridges. So it's very much possible allowed as long as you prove it's it's suitable it, you can do it in devon we are looking to build a one next year and it's a matter of just putting in planning permission and that shouldn't be a problem the one in devon uh, we got planning permission for it and there wasn't an issue i'm talking to bridge owners uh, local authorities around the country and I think that's they're quite happy with the idea generally. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, what is the flood resistant capacity of the stone bridges during the design life? And what are the possible design guidelines to prevent collapse? Uh, design guidelines we don't have on new bridges, particularly talking about flood. Now I'm very much aware of floods which taken down in Cumbria several bridges some are partially some were washed away completely uh, so you just obviously you have to make sure that you you don't block the uh, the, the floor uh, this is something so Daniel if you are if if this is your expertise I'm very I would be very happy to sort of talk to you about the adapting the design guideline for international standards. And I think that should be really included in, in more detail. A question for myself as well, when they're in Tanzania and they get these floods, how do the bridge, mm. how do the bridges hold up to them? Well, I haven't come across any prop, any bridge which has been washed away. I've heard about an arch which has just been built and the flood came in two hours and washed an arch away, but that was literally an arch ring, which with no scaffolding or nothing, or partial scaffolding. Once the bridges are built, because they put the a backing up to the top of the arch, they're incredibly strong. As long as you don't have scar, uh, probably they're not, not going to have very many problems with floods, although they might, I don't know. Thank you. Um, one of them from Steve Jones, uh, a big issue is the use of centering, which obstructs traffic or water flow. Can centering be eliminated from site, i.e. prefabrication in the factory? Then the problem is transporting large units to site while maintaining the horizontal thrust with temporary supports. This is the next stage for adapting for various scenarios. So Steve, I would be happy to chat about ideas. Yes, uh, uh, centering is normally put on top of the pier. So hopefully the pier is sort of above the water level. So it shouldn't obstruct the water flow, the centering shouldn't be in water at all. Uh, so it, however, uh, in terms of prefabricating, well, the voussoirs, the stone blocks are obviously cut to side, uh, size, all you need to do is basically to put it in like a Lego. Uh, I don't think prefabricate, but it, well, you can say the whole arch bridge cut stone, every stone is labeled, it's prefabricated. It doesn't, uh, if you can come up, if we can come up with a method of building stone bridges without centering, it would be absolutely brilliant. So we have been thinking about idea of building it offsite and lifting it in with the centering in place and then releasing the centering. Uh, we need to try. So if anyone is has an opportunity to do it and wants to try something, very happy to, uh, to, to, to develop ideas. Another one in from Mike here. Um, do you think that design codes will ever accept 500 year design life? I think the design codes would be uh, bridge owners would be delighted to accept 500 years design life, but no, not as a, uh, no, no, I, I'm not suggesting it should be 500 years design life. 
uh, but I think the environmental impact uh, impact evaluation should be based on the re realistic life expectancy. I mean, 120 years is fine, although uh, your grandchild will have to replace the bridge that you built today, which is not how Victorians built. Victorian built to last forever or for a very long time, not 120 years. One of the issues in terms of uh, concepts today that we are trying to minimize and optimize everything. And I think that is the wrong approach. For stone bridges, we need to maximize things. I know it sounds wrong, but uh, by adding an extra, say 10, 100 mil to the arch ring thickness, will give you another sort of, I don't know, 20 tons and another 100 years life expectancy. And what is the extra cost of making the arch ring thicker? basically nothing. So minimizing, just increasing the stress level and creating premature problems a lot of the times. It's, it's not viable. It sounds good. It sounds like this is the way to reduce environmental impact, CO2 emission. It's not. I think we are creating a maintenance pandemic, but minimizing everything and pushing the materials to the limit. If you've got a a Rolls Royce with a huge engine, it's going to last you a lot longer than a, a, a micro with a, with a, or whatever car with a one liter engine. So it's, it's having re resilience is another major issue. Okay, I think that's all the questions. So thank you very much for that talk. Very interesting. And thank you for your time. Thank you very um, much. Is there anyone, for, any uh, other questions? I'll, I'll let them, if there's any more, um, please, please put them on. But in our our next talk will be on the on the 9th of June. Uh, hopefully, we are. It's going to be a physical meeting um, at our old old venue, the Holiday Inn, Chester South. That will be on structural safety. Uh, so look out for details of that in the in the next coming week or so. And uh, yeah, thank you very much from the, the North Wales and Chester branch. And uh, hope you all have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you.